Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video where I'm talking about a book by W.G. Sebald called The Emigrants. Now in my previous video about the Man uh, Booker International Prize I talked about autofiction, uh, which is not a concept uh, I approve of either that it even exists because uh, I'm not sure it's relevant, uh, or B, if it does exist and it, it does what it says, then it's not a concept I favour as a reader or a writer. So the autofic is just where, you know, it's fiction, but it's heavy, heavily autobiographical, which I reject as a notion because I think all fiction is autobiographical. The key is how much work of transformation, of mutation, of distortion, of creativity, has the writer brought to the material to turn it to something that isn't purely subjective about their life, uh, but it has much wider, you know, charge to it, you know, a sort of greater universality. And the easiest way to do, not the easiest, the most significant way to, to demonstrate that, I think, is, is to sort of hint at the autobiographical nature, but, you know, to take it somewhere else completely, which is what this book does. So there's lots of photos in this book, but, you know, I don't know if they're found photos or say, but they are Sable's photos, but he's sort of riffing off, he's riffing stories off them. You know, he's, it looks as though he's just sort of, you know, stringing together narratives about four different people with this photographic proof to back it up, but that's not the case, it's deeply subversive. He's riffing stories off these photos that are like sort of found objects, you know, whether say whether they were sort of random or whether he, you know, they are his photos or not, I don't know. So, you know, it is four sections about four different men in post-war Europe, three of whom have died, so that their stories are not being told by them, they are being reconstructed, partly through the use of these photos and other sort of, you know, archive material. Um, so they don't get to speak for themselves that you know you're, you're, you're getting sort of fragments through photos which are static after all static images and you know the, the, the recall of other characters who are talking about them but of course weren't with them all the time and what links all four characters I know I said only the first three died uh, are dead, is that they are Jewish and, or part Jewish, and that they left for one reason or another their home, their place of birth. So that, that's why they're, they're, they're all sort of emigrants. So the first one is a guy who, uh, who fled Lithuania as a child, and then became the quintessential sort of British, uh, the, the Lithuania sort of from the pogroms, not the Second World War, I should say, uh, who became sort of quintessential British colonial you know, sort of officer or whatever. And now he's in his retirement, he's in his garden, you know, in the countryside, and he sits and stares at it all day. Um, his wife is still alive, but she's very active, and they're sort of living separate lives. And he ends up killing himself with a hunting rifle, one that he would have used on his colonial uh, expeditions. The next character is a school teacher who's quartered Jewish, who left his uh, his birth town, ends up teaching uh, in another town, in which he says he hates the town, he hates the people, he hates the kids, but has a curious sort of, he can't, he can't sort of really leave there, and he loses his job because of his sort of Jewish heritage, his sort of heritage. and yet he is still ends up serving in the German army, so, you know, they sort of strip him of his rights as a German citizen, and then make him as a German citizen fighting the war. And after the war, he uh, comes back, goes back to the same town that he has no love for, and picks up teaching there again. And in the end, he throws himself in front of a train. He also commits suicide. The third character uh, makes it to America, becomes a valet to uh, the scion of a, a very wealthy family, and so basically to keep an eye on him, because he's a bit of a, a playboy and a, sort of a person of excess. And they form a really tight bond, um, but his scion dies, and he's, re he's left rather sort of, you know, adrift, you know, he sort of has no purpose in life, and ends up um, sort of walking into a, a mental uh, asylum and asked to be sort of taken in and ends up having uh, electro uh, shock treatment uh, for his depression. 
Now, I think this ties it all. To, this story ties the other two together because what he's what he's also actually really doing is yes, he is depressed, you know, clinically depressed. But he has, I think, although it's in the state of, I think he has the idea that the ECT will burn out the memories of his pre-American life, i.e., the you know the hardship that forced him to flee America um, as a Jew. Uh, and if he can just sort of find refuge from those memories, then he can live out the rest of his life. Uh, it's terribly, terribly sad, you know, that he has this belief that, that these oppressive memories, which, you know, mean he can't have any quality of life, can be burned out of him, and therefore he will be a better, you know, better for it. Now, the fourth story is the only one that is an I rather than uh, he, because it's not being reconstructed directly. And that is an artist whose parents were in, I can't remember which part of Germany, it could have been Berlin, uh, they could sort of see what was happening, so they managed to get him on a plane over to England, so it wasn't kinder transport, the trains, you know, they got him on a plane, and they were going to follow afterwards, but, you know, they, they missed the cut-off point, really, and in the end they ended up in, in dying in the camps. And the boy uh, ends up in Manchester, and he says, as he's talking to the character, uh, he's sort of taking all this down. He says, well, the moment I left Germany by plane, I never spoke German again. And because I never spoke German again, I never had any memories other than that drive to that airport, which was sort of a transitional liminal journey. Because he needed German in order to conjure up and, and recollect the memories forged in Germany. And because he never spoke German again, I mean, it never specifically says that he lost his German, his German language, which sort of implied. He's also lost those memories. He has no way of getting back in touch with them. And that leaves uh, uh, a void, as does obviously the death of his parents. So, you know, when he grows up, he becomes an artist, a visual artist, a painter, and a, he works a lot in charcoal. And he's always drawing these, 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 uh, these portraits, um, but you know he constantly erases them, redraws them, and erases them so up to sort of forty times, because he doesn't have the people in front of him because they're dead or they're ghosts or they're voids in you know where they should be in his memory they're not. Um, he doesn't have photographs, which is ironic because the rest of the book is is very much around the photograph. So he doesn't have photographs of them to draw from. So he's never convinced that he's got it right. Um, and a lot of the photographs in this fourth section are about Manchester, uh, the town that he ended up living in. And it's a brilliant, brilliant depiction of the ghosts of Manchester, of Manchester's grand industrial past. So I'm just going to read you a description of that. As for myself on those Sundays in the utterly deserted hotel, I would regularly be overcome by such a sense of aimlessness and futility that I would go out purely in order to preserve an illusion of purpose and walk about amidst the city's immense and time-blackened 19th century buildings with no particular destination in mind. On those wanderings when the winter light flooded and deserted sorry, when winter light flooded the deserted streets and squares for the few rare hours of real daylight, I never ceased to be amazed by the completeness with which anthracite coloured Manchester the city from which industrialisation had spread out across the entire world displayed the clearly chronic process of its impoverishment and degradation to anyone who cared to see. Even the grandest of the buildings, such as the Royal Exchange, the Refuge Assurance Company, the Grosvenor Picture Palace, and indeed the Piccadilly Plaza, which had been built only a few years before, seemed so empty and abandoned that one might have supposed oneself surrounded by mysterious facades or theatrical backdrops. Everything then would appear utterly unreal to me on those sombre December days, when dusk was already falling at three o'clock, when the starlings, which I had previously imagined to be my migratory songbirds, descended upon the city in dark flocks that must have numbered hundreds of thousands, and shrieking incessantly, settled close together on the ledges and copings of warehouses for the night. Little by little, my Sunday walks would take me beyond the city centre to districts in the immediate neighbourhood, such as the one-time Jewish quarter around the star-shaped complex at Strangeways Prison, behind Victoria Station, 
this quarter had been a centre for Manchester's large Jewish community until the interwar years, but those who lived there had moved into the suburbs and the district had meanwhile been demolished by order of the, the municipality. All I found still standing was one single row of empty houses, the wind blowing through the smashed windows and doors, and by way of a sign that someone really had once been there, the barely decipherable brass plate of a one-time lawyer's office, bearing the names that had a legendary ring to my ear, Glickman, Grunwald and Grottergrohe. So, you know, apart from the fact that there's some brilliant phrases such as anthracite coloured Manchester and time blackened 19th century buildings, it's just, you know, it's the memory of a city, and, uh, you know, I know Manchester, you know, I have family in Manchester and that's exactly what it was like that, you know, there's these, sort of, it's like sort of like gaping holes in your teeth where buildings have been demolished and nothing's gone up in its place. And that was the case in the 70s that he's describing, or the 60s and 70s that he's describing here, and continued to be the case in the 80s. And that's why you've got bands like Joy Division. That's where they came out from, these, you know, desolate areas where there was like sort of one row of houses left, or there'd be a couple of houses and nothing in between them. So like the, the landscape after the Second World War, the immediate aftermath of the Luftwaffe's destruction of London and other cities, that's what they looked like. But this wasn't wrought by the Luftwaffe. This was wrought by, you know, decay and, you know, the, the, the municipality, Manchester sort of City Council, trying to regenerate and renew it. Now, today, Manchester is a bustling, thriving, booming place, so they got there in the end. They have revived it. And, you know, it's become sort of a cultural capital and an entertainment capital rather than an industrial one. But for 20, 30 years, it was just this barren wasteland with little pockets of, you know, former housing. You know, it's a, and, you know, this book is British. It's not only about biographies of people long lost, but it's a biography of a city. And, you know, this is so begu beguiling, this read, you know. If you sort of, if, if you sat down and told me what the elements of this plot were, I, I wouldn't have been interested in reading it. But Sable does it so brilliantly and efficiently you know that like, you know that section i read there was one of the more literary sections one of the more metaphorical sections he's very spare with his language it's not overwritten you know in any case at all but it's just the concepts that he's you know he's he's sort of thinking about in this book such as memory such as exile you know of the emigrants such as you know having somebody's story recaptured or reconstructed through witness statements, but they're patchy and static, you know, because they're not from the person themselves, not living, breathing, like the artist in here, but he's a ghost himself, you know. He spends 10 hours a day in his studio, which is completely isolated from any other human contact. So, yeah, this is a fabulous read. And absolutely, you know, I think it's satirising the notion of biography or autofiction, because it, it has all the sort of superficial form of one, or four in this case. But because of that thing of none of it's real, the photos are, are, are found photos, which he's used. And as I say, riffed off. Riff is the best word I can think of. So I think it's a deeply subversive book as well about, you know, on, on autobiography or autofiction. So, you know, five stars. And uh, so much so I went out and bought uh, his book, Austerlitz, which is what he's probably best known for. Uh, and that's my, uh, that will be my next Sabre I'll remember I decide to, to dip my toe in again. And that's also about this sort of reconstructing of identity in that a Jewish boy is sent over to England, um, you know, to escape from the Nazis and is stripped of his Jewish identity and recast by the English family that he ends up living with. So um, there you have it, uh, my first uh, W.G. Sabold. Uh, I say that I had read a book of his non-fiction, but my first Sabold fiction, and I'm a fan, I'm hooked. Um, he's mentioned very favourably by many, many writers, including Will Self, uh, interestingly, and I can see why. Okay, so uh, till next time, thanks very much.